nobody ever dies with an empty inbox. I mean, ever. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so, um, and I, and I think of it, think of yeah. it like laundry or washing dishes. There's always more dishes because it's, yeah. it's a process that's happening every day. Yeah. Your work every happens time. every day. You will, you will never be done. You will never be fully caught up. If you happen to think you're fully caught up at one point, you'll be behind in a week because of other things. So yes, it's key yeah. then to focus on what's the most important thing to get done today. If I could only get one thing done today, what would that be? What is my largest income outcome that I really yeah. want to achieve that I can do something towards today? And a lot of the little stuff, let it slide, delegate it, dump it, you know, uh, get it off your off your plate and, and you'll be a lot less stressed for it. So we work back from the result. So this is what we want. This is how we think we're going to get there. And then we market that into the team on the on the basis that they then understand why. So we call we call that start with why. Right. Okay. So start with why. So that that kind of what's in it for me kind of conversation as well. Um, yeah. So um, we had to very quickly stop talking about ideas in terms of uh, mine and Andy's idea and start talking about things in terms of is co breaks idea. So. Yeah. Uh, immediately that helps with buy-in from the off um, because they feel like we're not just doing it to line our pockets or doing it to make our lives easier yeah. or, or whatever it might be. Um, and then, the yeah, the other side of it is what's in it for me. So very much, well, if you can get, you know, for example, if you can do X, Y, and Z, you'll actually shave 30 minutes a day off the time you're doing grunt work and we're not going to ask you to fill that time with anything else so you can use that time to read you can use that time to play pool you can use that time to learn and immediately people are a lot, a lot more into it everyone wants clarity and simplicity and if you need buy-in from people from employees from stakeholders whoever's on the team that clarity just can't be underestimated just how much easier it is where everyone knows where they're going and these are the checkpoints along the way. So it's like, here's the strategy and vision and, and we're going to break it down into bite chunked or game plans, which are a series of tasks. And that's, that's laid out for people to follow rather than like, so I mean, I couldn't imagine working on something and have to chop and change every day. I mean, mm -hmm. there's adapting and there's just, oh, having the piss taken out of you. I think project management is another example of, um, a disaster waiting to happen in terms of the gap. So mm -hmm. the projects are getting bigger and the skills gap is getting wider. If you ask the, the average pre PM or PMO person about data or digital, there's a, there's a very large gap. And that's just from my observations. I, I haven't done any census data on this and you can tell me your experiences, but I, th I think it's, it's running away from us. And it's not like they have to understand it. Like we can operate an iPhone without understanding how the iPhone works but we're not giving them enough interface understanding so they understand how to operate those machines and those tools. Leadership is a function. So whether that is inhabited with someone at you know, the bottom, someone who's just coming in, working in the industry, or if someone is at the top, then that leadership, you know, raising your standards is relevant to every single person because of course it does start from the top. I mean, if the fish is rotten from its head, then that will infiltrate to yep. the body. This is, again, goes down to, that vision of that leader, that vision of saying, well, you know, we need to set our people up for success because if you're getting someone who, as you said, is technically brilliant to all of a sudden lead and talk and inspire people, then they're going to falter. They're not going to be as best as they can. And yes, of course, training is available, but we always have to look at what is the individual's natural disposition in order to achieve what they achieve and what they are naturally good at as well that's how you get the most out of people sometimes that's the best the best is not always the most and vice versa yeah yeah, but yeah. this is where you know leadership in organizations again does need to start seeing individuals as not just you know their work personality but their whole person as leaders we have a large part but we also know the importance of giving recognition where recognition is due. And people who do this, and it's not by reducing themselves, saying, no, you know, I didn't do anything, or it's not, it's accepting that, you know, that recognition, but 
also when you give that recognition to others, it is a reflection of the confidence of your own leader that you're not someone who is intimidated or threatened because someone else is doing better than you. They actually thrive off that when they can see that their team is quote unquote thriving as well. Yeah. And that is a marker of a confident leader. And that is something that is truly so rare to see. You know, it's one thing if everybody's remote. It's another if you are the remote person yeah. and everybody else is in the office. You know, we, we remember how during conference calls, you know, you had to be in China. So you're calling in for the conference call and everybody ignores you. Yeah. You know, you could have been off the phone for a while. The line went dead. Nobody knows. Right. Um, and it's important to remember that if you're going to be the remote worker, your career will pay a price for that, right? Now, people don't wanna hear that, but there's been a bunch of studies of this. They all show the same thing. And ask yourself this mental exercise. Say, suppose I have an identical twin in my office. We're doing the same job the same way. We're all both equally good at it, but your twin is going to go back to the office and you're going to move to Himalaya and be a remote employee. Which one of you is gonna get ahead? Well. Yeah. I mean, we know. And what were you going to have to do to fix that? Well, there's nothing I can think of the way organizations work now, because it's so much about access to information, opportunities to shine, you know, to grab the interesting projects early on, to know what's going on so you can adjust uh, to yeah. the whims in the organization. We don't know how to fix that. We forget the fact that the, the real stakeholders are much um, wider and more varied than you realize uh, i don't think you forget that in a hospital because yeah. i think i'm sure i'm sure i did in insurance because in insurance world you hope people will never use your product because that's how you rake in the money but in a hospital when i did my induction i went to visit a hospital and had a tour and we're going behind the scenes and stuff i remember standing at the reception desk and the lady in front of me was crying yeah. and she was a, a visitor or a patient and i was thinking wow, this is what we do. If my computers, if I my IT project puts computers into theatre and they break, someone gets their operation cancelled and they have to live with breast cancer for another day. Yeah. And that is unacceptable. Yeah. And so in the healthcare environment, it's really clear to see, and you, you never forget that the end customer is the patient, is the consultant. You're trying to make people's lives easier. British uh, native mother tongue English speakers um, we are, as a group, pretty awful to people who are oh, yeah. business professionals who speak English as their second, third or fourth language. Yeah. There's a sort of subset of professional English that is used by people who don't have English as their mother tongue, which is a much smaller subset and doesn't include all those colloquialisms and those things yeah. that you're talking about. Um, and it, we really ought to reduce, if we have a wide range of languages, we should make it easy for people. We need to adapt, we need to facilitate, we need to reduce our yeah. language down to, to that sort of business subset, really, if we can. We did an awful lot of conference calls. In fact, had I written the book five years earlier, this the virtual leadership book, it would have been called Conference Calls Made Easy. And it wouldn't have really helped at all in the pandemic, would it? Yeah. whereas it went a bit nuts. Um, where, so it used to be that I worked a lot with people who were doing um, international projects, um, often in big um, IT companies or pharma companies, financial services companies, where they had people scattered around the world, just like you described. Yeah. Um, and then when the pandemic hit, all of a sudden, I had teachers, people from universities, I had doctors, local government clerks, um, all sorts of people were picking up my book that I'd written essentially for international project managers in 2015 and finding it really helpful. Yeah. And I was thinking, hang on, I've, I've spent lots of time thinking this through. And if I've got this to the right level, it should work really well in this pandemic. And it did, which is really, really good. It's part of our inherent DNA. We want to belong. We want to affiliate. We want to make sure that we're with someone who has the similar thinkings that we do. That's not uncommon. There, what's uncommon is that when people isolate themselves, that's an anomaly, that's an outlier. Yeah. But for the most of us, we do want to interact with people and we can interact either personally and we have a lot of preferences of personal interaction, but there is a lot of individuals who can interact through some sort of technology. I mean, I'll give you in this example. My wife and I will be married 45 years this coming Saturday. 
We started our relationship. Oh, thank you. We started our relationship on the phone because we didn't live in the same community. We didn't go to the same school. And we were on the phone every night. We have, we used technology 45 years ago yeah. to create a relationship that has lasted this long. So when it comes to belonging, it's not just whether a person feels like they fit in because some people can fake it to fit in. It's a matter of the fact that they believe that where they're working is a special place. They, they promote it. They tell people they're proud of where they work and they're also included. So the belonging part not only says, do I feel like this is a special place where I'm working and I'll promote and talk about it, but I've been included. So to make this sense to those people listening, it's kind of like this. If I invite you to a party, then you have a sense of belonging because, hey, I'm with the cool kids. I got an invitation to the party, but you don't truly believe that you fully belong until when you get to the party, I make sure that you know where the food is. If there's music, I get you up on the dance floor. Is one, how do you how do you present things in a different way that's going to be interesting and people are going to get something from? And two, um, I said I mentioned to Eddie that I'd always wanted to write a book, and he says, "Whatever you do, don't write a book. It will just burn up so much time." <laughs> so that was a kind of gauntlet for me. Anybody who gives me a challenge like that, I'm off. Um, and all of a sudden, this idea came to me, and uh, it was based on Choose Your Own Adventure books, which. I don't yeah. know if you read them as a kid. I did, yeah. I, I well, uh, not a lot, but a few of them I did read, you, yeah. and I did enjoy and them. That jump to another page, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. So you got to, you know, you're given a choice: do you go left, do you go up the mountain, do you go down the river, and you go to the page. So I, I just thought it would lend itself. The stories would lend themselves really well to that. So it's a, it's a choose your own adventure type book. I can't use a choose your own adventure because it is trademarked. Oh, really? Um, they managed to sue. Um, there was the film out a couple of years ago. Black Mirror chap made, so they sued him for, for um, labeling it as a choose your own adventure. Oh, right. But it's a choose your own adventure type book. So you, there's a story happens and it, you have to make a decision. And as the reader, you decide what you're going to do. Are you going to go into battle with this person? Or are you going to give up on this idea? Are you going to take the easy route because that's what they're asking you to do? Or are you going to fight? So each, each story, and there's 10 stories. Um, and then there's some other stories in there as well, which I'll explain in a minute. But each story has a decision to make. And sometimes there's other decisions further in. And, and then you get the outcome of that decision. Yeah, you need to create a space. I think as well, rule break is probably not a great term because it just, you know, people yeah. want to be rule breakers or disruptors or they're against it. And it's not really about breaking the rules. It's no. about finding ways around them. Uh, yeah. there's a there's a really good book that helps um explain all of this yeah. there's some really great tools um it's called the change ninja handbook you've been practicing your pitching haven't you <laughs> <laughs> well yeah that's it isn't it it's like you said it's, it's about working within the constraints that you've got and pushing, sometimes you have to push everything to the limit. There's this guy who's a former head of training at Facebook, and it, it's probably been a couple of years since I interviewed him, but he had a book on culture. But I'll tell you, Nigel, this, this idea was helpful. And it's, I think it's related to what you said. He, and this is, if this is not a direct quote, it's really close. He said something along the lines of, every company sucks. Your job is not to make it not suck. It's to make it suck less. <laughs> and, and part of the reason why it sucks is you're part of it and you suck. <laughs> right? So I almost didn't interview him because that was like the depth of the book. But, but is there some truth to it? Like yeah. sometimes we think, we think, oh, my company is so messed up or, or whatever. Or, but hey, I'm part of it. So what am I going to do? And, and, and I could blame people. I could blame my team. I could blame the company. I could blame the culture. But what am I doing to make it better? Yeah. And, and make sure I'm not making it worse. <laughs> yeah. you know? People will just... Uh, act out of fear, right? And 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 put a lot of contingency on top of it, right? Yeah. And I mean, I could go on and on because the whole uh, culture behind this, right? Uh, in especially large organizations uh, where you run these um, uh, performance reviews and you get basically judged on this and or uh, PMOs with their metrics, right? Yeah. Which uh, use, oh, you haven't met this milestone, right? And then they punish you and you get basically... Um, 
you run around from meeting to meeting to, to justify uh, why is your project amber or red, right? Uh, and you feel like you're on some, uh, yeah. on, you know, you're being processed, yeah? Uh, well, actually, uh, what you need is someone to come to you and assist you in, in, like, you may put together a plan on how to bring it back, but actually, yes, as an organization in those scenarios, we should be turning around and going, that guy needs help. That girl needs help. Nobody wants to share their failures, right? Uh, I mean, we're sharing success stories, right? Uh, yeah. Of course, like, uh, you know, I was in uh, in organizations where they ran these, uh, what they call the brown bag sessions, right? Where you actually explain all your, oh, how have we done that? How have we achieved that success story, right? And, and you uh, tell them all about them and the entire organization is listening to you uh, of, of what you have achieved, right? But then we need the same thing for failures. No, yeah. how how did we run this project against the wall? Um, I mean, what what happened there? Right? Uh, please tell us. We yeah. want to know because this is where the insights are coming from. If we just uh, talk about success stories, we will not we will not improve. Uh, it's it's not going to work. Right? We need the full picture. But then there's this problem that people will not. Uh, or they will be at least reluctant to share failures, right? Nobody yeah. wants to share failures. People will just uh, act out of fear, right? And 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 put a lot of contingency on top of it, right? Yeah. And I mean, I could go on and on because the whole uh, culture behind this, right? Uh, in especially large organizations uh, where you run these um, uh, performance reviews and you get basically judged on this and or uh, PMOs with their metrics, right? Yeah. Which uh, use, oh, you haven't met this milestone, right? And then they punish you and you get basically, um, you run around from meeting to meeting to, to justify uh, why is your project amber or red, right? Uh, and you feel like you're on some, uh, yeah. um, you know, you're, being processed yeah uh well actually uh, what you need is someone to come to you and assist you in, in like you may put together a plan on how to bring it back but actually yes as an organization in those scenarios we should be turning around and going that guy needs help that girl needs help yeah and then i found oh there's this job called a project manager and apparently they're really organized and i think i can do that yeah. so then i sort of put the feelers out um uh, to see, you know, who I knew that might be able to give me a hand <laughs> yeah. getting that kind of job. And actually, um, I interviewed for what, the first one I interviewed for. I got that job. Brilliant. No, I'd had no, I had no experience in project management, I had no qualifications, no nothing. Didn't know what Prince 2 was. I'd be like, who's, who's Prince 2? <laughs> um, I think a lot of us did that when we first heard of it. I, it took many years for yeah. me to realize what the heck that was. Yeah. Um, but yeah, and that's where it, it just went from there. And I absolutely loved it. What I can say um, about the stroke, basically, I attribute it to putting my body through. Very little sleep, looking after it very poorly for you know mm. ten years, and yeah. that career did. As much as I loved that career, it did take its toll on my body, um, and also I did. I was involved. My very last project, I was involved. It uh, involved with it. Um, there was an individual who had a had a reputation for being unpleasant but this person made my life a living hell day nice. in day out I would say for six months and that was the tipping point for yeah. me and I couldn't take it anymore it applies certainly as an entrepreneur or employee and let's just do a really quick basic example let's suppose you get a little bit better at negotiating and we're not talking about being the world's greatest negotiator. We're just talking about being a little better than you are. So imagine if you're going for a job and you get a job offer for 70,000 pounds, but instead of taking it as it is, you negotiate. So you do a quick call or a few emails, will take about five minutes and you negotiate for 71,000 pounds. 
thousand quid more, that is not a huge lift. We can all imagine doing that. If you're 30 years old and you do this negotiation and you do nothing else in your career, if you sit in that same job for 30 years, five minutes of negotiating, just got you a thousand pounds more for the next 30 years, you just got 30,000 pounds, right? That's amazing. These skills that we're talking about, they're not learned the way we traditionally teach things. When you were learning the periodic table, your teacher said, here are the elements, and this is a proton, this is a neutron, remember it. And you'd remember it and you'd write it down on the test. That's not how we learn leadership, networking, negotiating, or all these other skills. There is no formula. There's not simple stuff to memorize. It's more akin to learning a sport or learning how to play an instrument. You have to try it. You have to practice. You have to get feedback and reflection. And so the best way to learn these skills is through peer learning groups. And this program I give away for free is something your organization can do to use it. The Hangry Snargler, which has, uh, that's a monster which encourages a ferocious appetite for work and people taking on too much. Yeah. Now, the problem with that is, as you've said, Nigel, is that often that means critical processes are in the hands of just a few people and Ultimately, that means the business isn't really secure long term because if you take away that person, yeah, which could, which could happen because what you know, if nothing else, we've learned from the last couple of years is how volatile everything is and how things can just change quickly. I had a podcast uh, interview scheduled two days ago, and I was just about to start it, and I had to go to the hospital with my child, and I'm. My child is fine, yeah. but you, you just never know when things are going to happen. So if you're not planning for these kind of uh, random events in your business and for people to cover for other people, your business isn't as secure yeah. and it's also not as scalable. Lots of fantastic books out there from, uh, you know, uh, from PMI, Agile Business Consortium in particular, around Agile Project and Program and Portfolio Management. But even they focus mostly on IT enabled stuff. And I just wanted to get away from that and say, let's look and see what any project might look like if you apply agility to it. And to my mind then, once you've done that, you can say, ah, you can use that as a model for building an organization that's friendly to projects. Other models are available, but here's one. Yeah. And I think and I have sometimes challenged a few folk on, on blogs around this, mm. is when someone says I'm being agile, the question I ask is what agile are you being or what agile are you talking about? I've seen you ask that question. <laughs> because, <laughs> because if someone says I'm, I'm, I'm being agile and I'm doing this, that and the other, I'm saying are you talking about software development? Yeah, okay, that's fine. Okay, so we know this. And so, for example, then you, so you can then go off and talk about scrums and goodness knows what else. If someone says, well, actually, I'm talking about how we do in the project. And then someone says, ah, and then they start talking scrum language. Um, and, well, that's not right, because one is, one is a software development approach and the other one is a project management approach. And they're not the same thing. Because because uncertainty threatens our very survival. So if you as as you talk back to caveman times, um, if there was uncertainty, it was, am I going to get eaten by a tiger or a whatever, or am I going to find food to eat today? Yeah. And that actually both of those threaten your very existence, and uncertainty uh, creates a threat around, am I safe? Can I, can I survive this threat? And the pandemic was a great example of that, where it yeah. was an existential crisis of uncertainty. And, and there is the existential psychologists um, have done lots of research into that and said that whenever there is uncertainty, our levels of anxiety will naturally increase. Well, that's certainly what we saw in the pandemic. And of course, you've got different stakeholders who have different perspectives, who yeah. all want different things. And yeah. that often is surprising, but 
I don't know why it's surprising because of course they have different things. Yeah. You know, the sales director is always going to want something different from the ops director yeah. because they're yeah. incented in different ways and therefore their requirements are always going to be different. And actually that's a positive thing because what that does is it creates a more well-rounded and more holistic view. This is where as, as project managers and as, as leaders, we need to be able to develop those skills of uncertainty and the skills to be able to say, okay, so if you want that, tell me why you want that and be really curious. Because what we tend to do is we make judgments really quickly. And of course, in uncertainty, those judgments are based on very little foundation. And when um, I'm in my stressed out situation, um, I move to three. And when I'm in my relaxed situation, I move to nine, right? And the underlying, um, you know, it, it, and I'll, I'll, I'll back out a, a little bit, you know, so even though there's nine types, you can also think of it as three groups of three. And, and there's an underlying motivator for each one of these groups of three. Yeah. And, you know, so the driver for the eight, the nine and the one is anger. And the driver for the five, the six, and the seven is anxiety. And the driver for the two, three, and four is feelings. So you have these three drivers. Um, and then as we are move into situations, those drivers will induce us to respond in certain ways. I'll tell you the punchline, right? So the Enneagram is this nine step system and it just happens that there are also these nine personality types one suited for each step in problem solving so if you know where you are in in the problem solving process then you'll know what personality dynamic is best suited for that and then i even will go into you know because all all types have access to all the other types we, we all do it's just with more or less ease yeah. right and you know so of course i'm a six so i have i know i have access to my type six and i've already told you i have access to the nine and the three and i and i also have access to what are called the wings the the um, types on either side of me so i also have access to the five and the seven 